verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. So I'm going to pause right here. Jesus finishes the upper room discourse. He finishes the high priestly prayer, which we've been studying in the last however many weeks. But now it says that he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron. He was in Jerusalem, which is this hill. We call it Mount Zion or the Temple Mount. But think more along the lines of Roxyan than, you know, Mount Shasta or something like that, right? Uh, you, you can hike up it, no problem. They walk down the east slope of Jerusalem toward Gethsemane, which is, you know, kind of, if you're standing in Jerusalem, it's like on the bottom left of the Mount of Olives. And, and the Mount of Olives is a, another one of those hills that they call a mountain. Between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives to the east was a, a brook, a, a stream. It's a, it's a narrow valley. Don't think Rogue Valley when you hear the Kidron Valley. Think two hills with a stream running down, you know, between. That was the Kidron, the brook Kidron. And this was during Passover when thousands upon thousands of lambs were being sacrificed. Passover lambs were being sacrificed upon the Temple Mount. From the altar, the blood of the lambs would, would flow down through a channel and, and drain down the brook Kidron, which is an, an interesting picture to consider. Jesus the true and better Passover lamb, the ultimate Passover lamb. He's going to Gethsemane. That is the garden that John doesn't name, but we know from the other gospels that is Gethsemane. Gethsemane meaning oil press or olive press. It's on the Mount of Olives there. Uh, they would grind, uh, grind out oil. It was the place of crushing. Jesus, the true and better Passover lamb, he makes his way down to and across the Kidron there, which would no doubt be blood red from the drainage from the Temple Mount. I wonder what must have went through his mind as he, I don't know if he, found a good place to, to cross over on some rocks or if he just tried to jump it or I don't know what they did to, to get across, but to see the blood that was a, a type and a picture of his own blood, which would be shed only hours from him walking across there. Well, they walk into this garden he and his disciples. And verse 2 says, Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. This is a go-to place for Jesus. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Pause. This is like, this is like a, a a movie scene where a bunch of crazy farmers show up at somebody's house, you know, with pitchforks and torches, kind of a, a thing. But but more than that, remember how in Ephesians six says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So more than an angry 
mob of priests and soldiers. These are human beings who hate and oppose God. These people, following the lead of Judas, are not are not acting alone in the sense that in the upper room we saw Jesus hand Judas over to the wicked one. He goes in the spirit of Satan, which is radical to think about. As I was studying this, I was thinking, it, it came to mind how in the Old Testament, uh, the servant of the prophet, I can't remember if it was Elijah or Elisha, but Gehazi, he's freaked out because the enemy is approaching. But the prophet prays that his eyes would be open. And if you remember the story, he, he, his eyes are open to the spiritual dimension. And in it, he sees the host of the Lord's armies, the angelic host. And all of a sudden, he's no longer filled with fear because he realizes that He's on the, the right side, right? He, he, he realizes that God and the heavenly host are greater than the enemies that are approaching him. Well, in a similar way, I'm curious what we would see if we could see what was happening in the spiritual realm. As these guys show up following Judas, who's filled with Satan, The kingdom of darkness ominously approaches the Christ, who from the very beginning was, was prophesied of, who the Lord said would, would crush the head of the serpent and do in the kingdom of darkness. They're about to face off. That old serpent, that, that beast, Satan, he's leading mortals and spiritual beings, fallen angels, demonic hordes toward the Christ. And so while they have their weapons and their lanterns and their torches, Underneath that and behind that and all around this is a radical spiritual scene. And, of course, it's not as though the heavenly host is just absent or that the Father and the Holy Spirit are just unaware. But the fullness of God holds back and allows the enemy close. This was all ordained by the Father. This was all orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has a resolve that we see in the other Gospels when he prays there in Gethsemane. Uh, John doesn't record it, but but you can read it in in the other Gospels where Jesus prays and he wins the battle before the battle in prayer. He prays, it says, in agony. It says that he prayed and it caused him to sweat and his sweat became great, like, like great drops of blood. He was pressed in the place of crushing Gethsemane, the oil press. He was pressed under the weight of the sin of the world, and he won the battle in prayer before the battle shows up. The serpent of old, the beast of Revelation, Satan, along with mortals and demons alike, they, they show up, they approach. In the spiritual dimension, it was on. <laughs> The enemies of God come and make war against Christ 
in this moment. Verse 4. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, he wasn't caught off guard. Uh, one commentator I read, I can't remember who, but, but one commentator said that they, they had lanterns and torches, perhaps intending to be able in the darkness of night to, to search you know, behind trees or in a, in a nook and cranny somewhere in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus may be hiding as he heard them approaching. But they didn't need the lanterns. They didn't need the torches. We'll soon see that their weapons are useless and powerless against Jesus. But the point I want to make here, and that I thought was interesting from whoever wrote that comment, is that uh, Jesus wasn't hiding away. Jesus knew all that was going to happen. And as we keep reading, we see that Jesus takes the initiative in his own arrest. Again, this is ordained by the Father, our redemption, via the cross, is ordained by the Father. It's accomplished by the Son. He takes initiative here. He, he already won the battle in prayer. Now he's going to win the battle on the cross. And he does accomplish our salvation, and it's, it's, it's revealed to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are sealed in it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and salvation is applied to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We learn all these things in Ephesians 1. So Jesus, verse 4, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, who do you seek? Note the way it says he came forward. He doesn't shrink back. He comes forward. And he initiates, whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. He was Jesus of Nazareth. That is a right and true statement. He was from this little town. And, and it's, it's well known. You know, people would say, can anything good come from there? In his first coming, he comes meek and mild from a, a city that probably wasn't even represented on most maps, right? That's true. He is Jesus of Nazareth. But Jesus responds to them not saying, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. He responds to them, verse 5, Jesus said to them, I am. I am. The word he, he says, I am he in our Bibles. That's a, that's a goof. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a mistake by the translators. In, in some Bibles, it's in italics to show that it wasn't in the original language. Uh, their intent was good to try and bring some clarity to what Jesus is saying. But, but uh, if you leave the word he in that verse, it, it removes the intended punch that Jesus is making. When he says, I am, he's saying, ego, I me. We've talked about it often because Jesus makes seven I am statements in the Gospel of John, which we've already looked at. But it's reaching back to Exodus 3, the burning bush passage where Moses says, God, who, who should I tell him if they ask who sent me? What's your name? God says, I am that I am. He says, ego, emi. And the Gospel of John fills uh, Jesus fills in that blank. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am. He could have said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Come and get me, you know. But he reaches back for the tetragrammaton. He reaches back for the, 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 the name so holy, the Jews wouldn't even write it out in its fullness. They would leave out 
the vowels. And so all we know is Y-H-W-H. We're not sure if it's pronounced Yahweh or Jehovah. Those are our two best guesses. But Jesus proclaims that as his identity. He's claiming deity here. And look what happens. When Jesus said to them, I am, they drew back, verse 6, and fell to the ground. It's wild. And so he asked them again, as they're all trying to get up, right? <laughs> Lost my spot here, one second. They fell to the ground, so he asked them again, verse 7, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. He's looking out for his guys. Verse 9 says, this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. We, we've looked at this recently because he just was talking about this in the high priestly prayer. He was talking about this upper room discourse. Of those whom you gave me, it says, I have lost not one. If you're coming for me, here I am. But don't, don't mess with my guys, my sheep. Verse 10. Oh, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself there. At this point, you might be sitting there thinking, okay, why did Jake label verses 1 through 9 the sword of the Lord? There is no sword to be spoken of in this passage. Well, it really gets to what happens when Jesus says, I am, and they all fall down. They all fall back. Many have tried to write this off or explain this away by saying that they were just blown away at, at uh, the power that he spoke with and, and the words that he said, you know, reaching back like that. And, and it, they just, they lost, you know, their balance or something. They, you know, it, it just, this argument, when, when I saw it, I just like, what are you even saying? That they were just amazed and so they fell over? Uh, one that made more sense, but that is absolute nonsense at the same time. Uh, some have suggested that they just happened to fall coincidentally at this point because the Mount of Olives is steep. Uh, and, and, and it's just funny. People don't often want to just take the word for what, it, for what it is and what it says. I believe something radical happened here. Again, this is not merely a conflict between flesh and blood. The language of Ephesians 6, and I'm reading from the ESV, but, but the language of it is, is cosmic. Again, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers. I read that, and I'm like, what even is that? Right? Against the, the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There are, in John 18, cosmic powers, spiritual forces of evil at play in this present darkness, this dark, ominous scene where they come at Jesus with weapons and torches and stuff. And in the face of that, Jesus claims his deity. And at the power of his word, his enemies, and I think mortal and spiritual alike, fall back. Not only is he claiming deity, he's displaying power and authority in and over the situation. They do not take my life, Jesus said, but I lay it down willingly. Jesus is in absolute power and control. And he's under control. But the divine nature that is in him 
it, it leaks out in this story. And I think in this supernatural and spiritual way, his enemies fall back. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Because I couldn't help but think of Revelation 19 as I was considering this story. Revelation 19, we're jumping in way towards the end of the, the story. <laughs> the great tribulation has already transpired. And while in John 18, we're observing Jesus in his first coming, in Revelation 19, we are observing Jesus in his second coming. And I want to pick it up with you in verse, let me see, verse 19. We'll start there and then we'll back it up uh, to verse 1, or verse 11, pardon me. But in Revelation 19, 19, we see a parallel of sorts. In John 18, the old serpent, Satan, the beast, he's leading both spiritual and mortal forces who hate God and oppose God. He's leading them against Christ. Same author, John the Apostle, says here in Revelation 19.19, 19, in the second coming, the same kind of scene, but on a much grander scale. Verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. We see the enemy rallying together on this massive scale, as big as it can get, scale, to make war against the Christ. Look now back at verse 11. We're, we're winding it a little bit. He says, verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Remember in, in the Gospels, when Jesus makes his triumphal entry, he doesn't come on a horse, he comes on a donkey. Not a horse of war, but a donkey of peace. That's the first coming. Here in the second coming, he comes not on a donkey, but on a horse, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes, this is our Lord. This is Jesus. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. It, it reminds me of how we don't even know how to pronounce I am. We don't even know how to pronounce the name that Jesus speaks forth in the Garden of Gethsemane. It doesn't specify what this name is, it, but it does say that, that no one knows it but him. He, he, he has this name. Verse 13, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And check this out. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Remember the Gospel of John. Chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. We see the same one, the same Word. Only we're beholding His glory here in an entirely new way than in the Gospels. Yes? Yes? His name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him 
on white horse, uh, white horses. Pay attention specifically here, verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. So we see the word. Ephesians 6 calls the the, the sword of the Spirit the word of God. Here we see the word of God with a sword of the Spirit. The sword, don't don't picture a giant actual blade coming out of his face. No, it's... His word going forth. And at his word, verse 15 says, he will strike down the nations and he will rule. And, 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 and again, think back to John 18. He's going to the place of crushing. He's going to Gethsemane, the oil press, where he will be crushed. And that night he would be crushed underneath the wrath of God. But in the second coming, he's got a robe dipped in blood, but now he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. It's it's so similar, but, but note the differences between the first and second coming of Jesus. Verse 16, on the robe, or on his robe, and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and with a loud voice. Note the voice that we've seen in the Gospel of John. First we see John the Baptist with a voice crying out like one in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. But then he says, I'm the bride, uh, excuse me, I'm the best man. Jesus is the groom. He's the bridegroom. And I'll rejoice at his voice. And then we've talked about it as we've seen the voice, the voice, the voice pop up of the Lord, of the Christ, show up in the gospel of John. Now this angel standing in the sun with a loud voice calls to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come gather This is radical. For the great supper of God. To eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, again, verse 19. And the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. The beast was captured. And with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And note verse 21 specifically. Verse 15 and 21 are the the big highlights I want you to see here. Verse 21. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Radical. The same serpent, the same beast, the same devil who in and through Judas, leads a band of both mortal and spiritual enemies of God against Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, is seen here in Revelation leading a massive global horde and host of the enemies of God, both mortal and spiritual, against the Christ. And ultimately, the first coming is not for Jesus to come and execute judgment. The first coming is not for the sword, which speaks of the word of God, Ephesians 6. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this in a, in a few minutes here. But, but uh, the sword also speaks 
very much of judgment at times in the Bible. The first coming was not for the sword of judgment and, and wrath. The second coming is for that. The first coming is for the cross. The second coming is for the sword. The first coming is for Jesus to be crushed. Isaiah 53. Broken. Isaiah 53. That by his stripes we can be healed if we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He comes to be set forth, Romans 3 declares, as a propitiation for our sins. Not to execute wrath, but to be a propitiation. A propitiation, my favorite definition that I've come across, Wayne Grudem wrote this. He said, a propitiation is a sacrifice that bears the wrath of God to the end, and in doing so, turns God's wrath toward us into favor. <laughs> Again, a propitiation is a sacrifice that bears the wrath of God to the end and in so doing turns the wrath of God toward us into favor. The first coming was for the cross where Jesus, the true and better sacrificial lamb, the true and better Passover lamb, on the cross, bears the wrath of God to the end, and in doing so, turns the wrath of God toward us into grace. Favor, inheritance, blessing, salvation, sonship. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. He accomplished it on the cross. The first coming is for the cross. The second coming is for the sword. But who he is in power and glory as he's about to go to the cross, like I mentioned before, I don't know if this is the best way of phrasing it or not, but it's almost as though it just his glory and power, it, it, it leaks out. <laughs> he says, I am and they fall back. And it's a subdued foreshadowing, a preview of that which will ultimately come to pass in his second coming when he comes upon a horse in power and glory and judgment that he will execute for those who were who reject and refuse that which he accomplished in his first coming. The parallels were too striking for me to not at least bring it up. I dig this stuff. Jesus, he, he, he's foreshadowing that which he will accomplish in his second coming, but first he stays focused <laughs> on the mission that he is to accomplish in his first coming. Back to John 18. So we see a, a foreshadowing, a, a preview of things to come in verses 1 through 9 of the sword of the Lord. Interesting parallel there. But then number 2, verse 10 we see the sword of Peter. <laughs> and you gotta love Peter, but my goodness, after all of this, when we behold the, the glory and power of the sword of the Lord, Peter just looks so silly as he pulls out his own sword. So Jesus, with a spoken word, says, I am. They drew back and fell to the ground. He asked them again, verse 7, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was fulfill, to fulfill, again, verse 9, the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me, I lost not one. 
But then that squirrely sheep of his, Peter. <laughs> Verse 10, then Simon Peter, having a sword. <laughs> it just, it cracks me up, man. When I consider the Lord and when I consider Revelation 19, again, this just looks so silly to me. Then Peter, having a sword. I got a sword. <laughs> he drew it. And he struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus, and uh, several have suggested that perhaps he's named here. Uh, it's not just left an unnamed servant, but Malchus. Uh, likely, he was ultimately con converted and, and born again and numbered among the, the sheep and fold of God. And oftentimes in the New Testament, uh, saints will be mentioned because these, uh, these documents, whether it's a, an epistle or a gospel, they would be circulated among the church, right? Copied down and, and circulated and read. And these people would know the characters often. Uh, if, if in fact he was saved, they'd be like, it was Malchus, you know, <laughs> like I know Malchus, uh, which is which is kind of a fun fact. But also, uh, John doesn't mention this here, but in the other Gospels we read that after Peter chops off his ear, Jesus applies a healing touch. The ear goes back. <laughs> Jesus undoes what Peter does with his sword. Malchus is walking in the language of Ephesians 2 among the sons of disobedience at this time. He's an enemy of God, walking among the sons of disobedience against the Christ. Let me read to you from Ephesians 2. It says that we were all once dead in our trespasses and sins, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now in the generation Paul was writing to in 2024, certainly the spirit that was at work, the evil spirit that was at work in John 18 as they come to make war against Jesus. At work in the sons of disobedience. That's Malchus. Malchus is numbered not with the disciples of Jesus, but with the sons of disobedience, following the prince of the power of the air. We see the sword of Peter come out. Again, the sword, as we've been talking about it, a picture, a type of the word of God. Also a picture and type of the judgment of God. Peter decides he's going to wield that. And before I, I continue with that thought, uh, I, I want to, I want to read to you from Jeremiah 25 because Jeremiah connects these ideas of, of the sword and judgment. Jeremiah 25, verse 15. Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. Then in verse 29, You shall not go unpunished, for I am summoning the sword against all the inhabitants of the earth, declares the Lord of hosts. And then in verse 31, The clamor will resound, it says, to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against the nations. He is entering into judgment with all flesh. And the wicked will be put to the sword, declares the Lord. And I just wanted to read that so you don't just have to take my word 
for it. The, the sword is a picture both of the Word of God and of judgment. And those aren't the only places where it's a picture of the Word of God, you know, Ephesians 6 and, and of judgment, Jeremiah 25. Those are just the ones that I pulled out. But Peter, when he's there as this spiritual conflict is happening, and, and he's in the vicinity, in the presence of, of Malchus, just a servant. Malchus isn't the high priest. Malchus isn't one of the, the big, scary soldier guys. He's a servant among the sons of disobedience. Peter unsheaths the sword and he wounds someone who Jesus would heal. That's significant to me. It's also significant that he cuts off not a finger or a toe or, you know, a real kill shot, but he cuts off the guy's ear. That guy would not be able to hear anymore from the place where Peter swung the sword. I want to take this as a warning not to unsheath the word of God and swing it at people in a way that could potentially forever remove their ability to hear from the people of God, the word of God. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God, James says. James says, there is one judge. and Behold, he's standing at the door. He wasn't talking about you. He wasn't talking about me. I am not the one God has ordained and called to come with a sword of judgment against Malchus. Just some guy who was there following the prince of the power of the air, walking among the sons of disobedience, who God would heal, who Jesus would touch and love with healing and grace. It's not my place to start swinging at his face. When followers of Jesus, like Peter, is a follower of Jesus, he unsheaths the sword, he starts swinging at a servant of the, you know, one of the sons of disobedience. When Peter did that, and when we do that, often we are very inaccurate with the sword. That's an interesting one. And we also cause damage. We, 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 maybe we even have good intentions, but we don't accomplish anything good. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We just inflict damage that the Lord may need to come and undo, you know, clean up the mess we made. <laughs> when I start swinging the sword at people, you know, often those who swing the sword at people like that are doing so inaccurately. That, that's interesting. Man, they're so upset about whatever and maybe what they're saying is not even true. According to the Bible, they're trying to wield and swing around. So often people major in the minors and flunk. Major in the minors, yeah. The, 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 the majors, the, the big, majorly important things of the faith, like the resurrection of Jesus Christ, like salvation by grace through, grace through faith alone in the finished work of Christ, like the deity and humanity of Jesus, uh, these, these sort of things, that the greatest command is love. The, the, these, these fundamentals, they often go overlooked. Just like when Jesus rebuked the religious leaders, you're so bent out of shape 
you know, over, over minute traditions concerning the Sabbath. But you're mean. <laughs> Jesus says, don't neglect, you know, tithing and fasting twice a week. Like, don't stop doing that. Those are good and right things. But you don't know God, and you're not loving him, and you're not loving people. You're swinging around the sword, and you're doing so inaccurately. They were not right concerning the Sabbath. The Sabbath was not made, or excuse me, they were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for them. They were taking the beauty of the rest that God has given and turning it into this radical burden. They were, they were wielding the sword inaccurately and in a way that was not winsome. No Gentiles were being converted. In fact, they had put up a big wall to keep Gentiles out. That Jesus would go to great lengths to tear down, to welcome people in. I want to learn from this story. Especially because I, I, I found it interesting... I read a book this week. It was really good. It was by Craig Rochelle. He's the pastor of the largest church in the United States currently. Over like 85,000 people. It's counting uh, multiple locations. They do the whole satellite thing. Um, interesting church, interesting guy, interesting book. In it, he said one thing that, that I, I thought was interesting among several actually, but he said the contemporary church model is tired. There was a time when people were blown away because the, the norm, the norm was clergy in robes and uh, very traditional sacramental services. Uh, worship was done with a hymnal and people were saying things like you can't worship God with the devil's instruments. And so they'd, you know, freak out if anybody pulled out a guitar, you know, or, uh, you know, they just used the organ and, and, and everything. And that was, that was fine. But, but it, was, it was a wild, wild thing when people started showing up to church in sneakers for anybody to show up in what I'm wearing was radical. And very many people very much looked down on it. How could you enter into the Lord's presence in a hoodie, right? Uh, or with long hair and bare feet or whatever. You can't worship God with the devil's instruments and... But, but there was also, on the other side, there was a bunch of people that were really stoked. Really stoked. And did you hear? They had a drum set at church. That's so cool, you know. But, but Craig Groeschel was, was pointing out, and, and I mentioned the size of his ministry because this guy is leading the charge in many ways in the contemporary church model. And he's the one who said, it's tired. He's like, in a lot of ways, just like the norm was a hymnal or an organ or everybody wearing a suit and tie. He's like, it, he, he, you know, however he phrased it, he guarantees that it has been decades since you heard somebody by the water cooler express how cool and radical and shocking being blown away that people were going to church dressed casually. <laughs> he's like, that. He's like it's expected. Uh, he goes, we don't expect stained glass anymore. We expect a stage, right? We don't expect a pipe organ. We expect somebody to play G, D, E minor, C with a capo on a guitar. It's just like, it's the way, like, it's just, it's the new, it's the new thing. It's the new norm. It's the new tradition and it's tired. And he was talking about Gen Z. And I thought it was interesting because he said, the up and coming generation is not 
impressed with, you know, lights, cameras, and action. And I was thinking about that. It's so true. You know, as I, as I observe my generation and the upcoming generation, I, I've, been, I've been interested to hear several times now uh, in different outlets that, that people are saying that Gen Z is aging really poorly. <laughs> they're, they're aging quickly. They have more at their fingertips than any generation in the history of mankind, yet they are aging rapidly. They're more entertained than anyone and often isolated and depressed. They don't long for lights, cameras, and action. They have nothing but that all the time. The same is true for all of us in 2024, regardless of your age. We, we just have it. What we need... is connection, specifically, namely, biblically, with the Lord our God, by His Spirit, and through His Word, according to His loving kindness and grace. They say Gen Z's aging because they're good. They have good hearts. They want to do good and feel good. I talked about this not that long ago with the whole idea of moralistic therapeutic deism, if you remember that. This generation wants to do good and feel good and wants to end evils against fellow humans like racism and trafficking and so forth. but it's exhausting. And we can do nothing of eternal value, of eternal, lasting good, fruit that remains, apart from Christ. And there is a void and brokenness in the soul of every human that cannot be filled or made whole with humanitarian efforts. We can only be filled and made whole by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as I consider Peter unsheathing the sword inaccurately, inappropriately, the wrong time, the wrong place, chopping off some guy's ear who's just there. He's following the course of the world. He's among the sons of disobedience. And Peter's wounding this guy that Jesus would heal with a loving touch. It makes me want to do what Jesus tells Peter to do in verse 11. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Now, I don't mean sheath your sword I don't mean close your Bible, put it on the shelf, and stop picking it up. Uh, no. But sheath your sword of judgment. <laughs> that doesn't mean that we're not to have discernment. Discernment is good and right and necessary. But, but hear my heart on this. Don't just go swinging it at people, I, I, the Lord telling me. Perhaps us. Jesus says, Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? If, if verses 1 through 9, the sword of the Lord, and, and chapter 10 is the sword of Peter. Verse 11, the cup of wrath and salvation. Again, it's this idea of propitiation. The second coming is where judgment and wrath will be executed on those who reject Christ. The first coming, and our role right now, is not that. Our role is to love people. How do we do that? We point them to
to the one who took the cup of wrath so that he could give us the cup of salvation. Sheath your sword. Stop swinging that thing like that. Stop wounding the one that I would heal. I'm going to the cross. to be a sacrifice, a propitiation, a a, a sacrifice. I am going to bear the wrath of God to the end. And in doing so, turn the wrath of God toward you, and, and we could say toward us, into favor, into grace, by which you can be saved And Malchus can be saved. And again, most agree that Malchus was ultimately saved. We've been talking about how God is a community of love. And Jesus is cut off in order to make a way, an access point through him for us into this divine life, into this community of love because of his work on the cross. With that in mind, we come to this passage. And it's my heart that as an individual and that as a little local church, that we can learn to sheath our sword in this way and point people to the word, point people to the scriptures, Point people to the person, the word. And his name was called, Revelation 19, the word. (laughs) Point people to the word that was with God in the beginning, who became flesh and dwelt among us and bore the wrath of God to the end in order that we might be saved by grace through faith in what he accomplished. It's my prayer for my little family that we as a nuclear family, husband and wife and littles, that my little Sartain crew could be a community of love that reflects God. I want to be that as an individual. I want to be a person of love, like God is love. I want to be like Jesus. I want to, like Jesus personifies love. I want to do that as an individual. I also want that for my family. And, and I want to have hospitality according to the scriptures and, and, and create space for, for people to be welcomed in, right? Not into my family, as a nuclear family. Uh, maybe we've talked about adoption, but, but as an access point for people to, to experience the love of God and come into his family, as an individual, as a nuclear family, as a little tiny church body. If we're not, what are we doing? This generation doesn't need lights, cameras, and action. This generation needs to connect with the word that is living and powerful and able to pierce into their soul dividing soul and spirit and joints and marrow. We need, we need to love God and experience the love of God. And we need, we need one another. People need people. The people of God need the people of God. We need to connect, right? May God give us grace to reflect him in these different spheres to continue his work, create space for his healing touch to be applied in this generation and in this community to the renown, glory, honor, and praise of the name, the character, and nature of God in Christ.